Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this is going to be our last webinar before the FPA conference in January. So we made it a good one. We're going to have Dr. Michael Lim speak with us about surgical treatment of trigeminal neuralgia, what to choose and when. He's got a presentation plan, but we also have lots of time uh, available for Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A box. You can toggle to the bottom of your screen and you should get a bar with different kinds of um, buttons and you can add your question to the Q&A function there. And I will keep an eye on those and I will present those to Dr. Lim when he's done with this presentation. We are so excited to be able to launch registration for our virtual conference. This is going to be the second virtual FPA conference. And this time it's going to be a full weekend. It's going to be Saturday, January 29th and Sunday, January 30th, 2022. We have two full days planned of wonderful presentations, everything from diagnosis to surgical treatment, uh, other kinds of treatments, uh, complementary health approaches, mindfulness, mental health topics. You're going to hear from uh, patients and caregivers, uh, as well as the FPA leadership, and many of our medical advisory board members, including Dr. Lim. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over. Actually, I have a little introduction here. Dr. Lim is the chair of the Department of Neurosurgery and a board-certified neurosurgeon specializing in brain tumors and trigeminal neuralgia. Dr. Lim's clinical interests include the treatment of benign and malignant brain tumors with special interest in gliomas, meningiomas, metastatic tumors, and skull-based tumors. Dr. Lim also specializes in surgical treatment for trigeminal neuralgia and is a very valued member of the FPA Medical Advisory Board. So Dr. Lim, take it away. Allison, thank you so much for that kind invitation. I mean, kind introduction. And um, I'm really honored to be here uh, to be able to talk to you a little bit today about, um, you know, surgical treatments for trigeminal neuralgia. So I'm going to share my screen here and hopefully I hope folks can see the screen. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, many of you have looked at videos, you uh, read about trigeminal neuralgia online, and you know that there's a lot of things out there for trigeminal neuralgia. So, you know, I, I wish I could say there's always one right answer, but there isn't. But I, I'm going to share today a little bit about um, thoughts and and kind of um, the way I um, recommend or advise my patients uh, who present with trigeminal neuralgia. So uh, before I begin, I want to make, uh, I want to have, uh, I want to, these are my relevant disclosures. Um, most of it, uh, almost all of it is actually in brain tumors. But before we begin, you know, I think when patients uh, present with, um, you know, facial pain and they're given the, the diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia, you know, we see lots of, I see lots and lots of facial pain patients in my clinic. And the thing about trigeminal neuralgia is that you know, just to kind of review, uh, patients present usually with, you know, sharp stabbing electrical pain. Oftentimes it lasts for a few seconds. It can go for a few minutes. It can go for hours, but uh, there's usually an episodic nature to it. Oftentimes patients report that there's some sort of sensory stimuli, eating, drinking, or cold wind that triggers this pain. And most of the time it's on one side of the face. However, you can have it on both sides of the face um, and have these symptoms. And uh, at the end of the day, if you look at this on this page, I don't put uh, things such as MRIs or blood tests because this is a clinical diagnosis. And uh, we've known about this diagnosis for many, many decades, um, actually probably even over a century now. And uh, still to this day, we have to make this diagnosis based on clinical symptoms, not on uh, imaging or MRIs which then tells you that sometimes or not all trigeminal neuralgia pains are the same and the etiology of this pain is not the same. And, and uh, as a result, you have, we try to, uh, as part of our workup, rule out other things. 
for example, shingles or herpes uh, virus, which causes shingles, can, can cause facial pain. You could have dental problems, you could have eye disease, temporal arteritis, and intracranial tumors that can all cause facial pain. And so most of the time when we are uh, evaluating patients with facial pain and uh, someone comes with trigeminal neuralgia, we're trying to assess for other things that it could be. Now, trigeminal neuralgia is one of the most common causes of face pain in the US, but it's, what's interesting is that it's actually um, a low number of patients that are actually diagnosed per year, 15,000 new cases per year. Just to give you some sort of reference, you know, glioblastomas, uh, which is a brain tumor is a, is considered a rare tumor. And there's only about, uh, again, 15,000 cases that are diagnosed per year. The difference is though, with facial pain, uh, and trigeminal neuralgia, even though they call it the suicide disease, it isn't something that you die from. And so uh, if you, uh, accumulate 15,000 cases a year over yeah, 30, 40, 50 years, uh, there's actually a lot of people out there. And as a result, it's actually the most common cause of face pain in the US. And uh, while we've seen uh, budgets of, of healthcare in the US uh, in, in the trillions, uh, still trigeminal neuralgia uh, costs a significant amount to society. It, you know, part of this $100 million is healthcare dollars, but the other part is that, um, and lost productivity from uh, workers. What's interesting about trigeminal neuralgia is that some people say that uh, their dental procedure caused it, but it, I call it, it's more of an association. It occurs a little bit more uh, frequently in women than men. And um, you know, if you read through the literature, they say uh, the onset is somewhere between the fifth and second, seventh decades of life. However, I've seen kind of a bimodal peak. I've also seen a, a group of younger patients also that present. So as I alluded to earlier, what is the cause of facial pain? And uh, a lot of my patients uh, come to me and some, some with facial pain and say, well, I have trigeminal neuralgia because um, there's a vessel touching my nerve and I have face pain. And uh, oftentimes what I tell people is that there is in the literature, some suggestion that this vascular compression can cause facial pain and uh, particularly trigeminal neuralgia. And the thought behind it is that the vessel, as it rubs on the nerve, it's like if you were to take, for example, your hand and, or fingers and rub an electrical cord, if you rub it initially, nothing's going to happen. But if you uh, rub it over years, the insulation can strip away and you can get short circuiting. And that's what a lot of people, or that's what, what people think is happening with uh, trigeminal neuralgia. However, uh, just to be clear, not everybody with vascular compression can have sharp stabbing pain and not everybody with a, um, a vascular compression even has pain. Uh, what's interesting is I think that perhaps even more than 50% of the population actually has a vessel touching the nerve and not everybody presents with, or with any sort of facial pain. So the, the cause of trigeminal neuralgia is probably a lot more uh, detailed or extensive than we um, think, but there seems to be this association of, of a vascular compression. So as I alluded to earlier, the diagnosis or making the diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia is based on the symptoms that patients uh, present with. Um, again, the, the keywords are the sharp stabbing or electrical pain triggered by eating, drinking, or cold wind, and it's usually episodic. Um, and when patients get scans, again, that workup is to rule out other causes such as tumors. So, you know, patients also say, well, I'm here because I got the scan and it's imaging scan shows this uh, vessel touching the nerve. Again, the Fiesta scan, when we do the, these Fiesta scans, um, depending on other companies, it's called Drive, True FISP, um, whatever the um, scan is, oftentimes we're looking for, um, uh, the, the MRI is done for two reasons. One is to rule out, again, other causes. And the other is to look for this association. If there is a blood vessel touching the nerve, it does have implications to what sorts of surgical treatments the patient may be eligible for. So as an example, this is the uh, um, high resolution skull base MRI. And uh, what I'm gonna do is as we go up, this is the beginning of the fifth nerve, the trigeminal nerve here and here. 
but this is the patient's right side because we're looking at the patient from the foot up. As you can see, all of a sudden there's this little dark swoosh that goes across. And if you follow that as in the next few uh, slides, you can see that it's essentially like, uh, we're just taking slices through an arch of a vessel. You can see that the blood vessel is actually making contact with the nerve uh, in this particular patient. So what is the treatment for trigeminal neuralgia? And uh, at, the end of what, at the end of the day, the first treatment really is usually medical treatment for patients. And um, when patients get put on meds, most of them say, oh, wait a second, I'm put on seizure meds. Um, and that's exactly right. Uh, as I int intimated earlier, the uh, cause of facial pain or, or the symptoms of the electrical sharp stabbing pain are more electrical in nature. It's almost a sharp, uh, it's almost this short circuiting phenomenon. Hence, uh, seizure meds, which uh, alter um, uh, transmission of um, electrical signals uh, makes sense. So classically speaking, patients get put on something called Tegretol, and about 70% of the patients actually can get uh, relief of their pain once they've been put on Tegretol. There are other drugs like uh, gabapentin or Neurontin or Lyrica. Um, these are all variations of a theme, but um, they again work to stop electrical uh, transmission. Patients are also can be sometimes put on a little bit of black, baclofen, which helps them. But over time, some patients can have uh, symptoms from this. And uh, for example, patients can get really drowsy from the Tegretol. They feel like they're almost thinking at a slowed state. Uh, the description that a lot of my patients tell me is they feel like they're living in a, a fog bank. Um, and uh, and uh, patients also report being very unsteady on their feet. And sometimes when I uh, examine or when I examine my patients in clinic, I'll have them walk a straight line, kind of like someone walking a tightrope. And a lot of times people on, on Tegretol or, or uh, Dilantin or Neurontin, if they're on a lot of it, they, they're very unsteady on their feet. So, you know, if you get to a point where the medical options are failing you or uh, fails a patient, there are uh, some good surgical options for patients. Okay. And in general, uh, these are kind of the surgical options that are out there again for patients with trigeminal neuralgia. There's the rhizotomy, the stereotactic radio surgery, and microvascular decompression. So when and where to choose which procedures um, is, is again uh, a, an individual choice. What I like to say is you're choosing between good, good, and good. It's just that I think in some patients, one treatment might be better than the other. So what I'm what I thought I'd do for this part in talking about which treatment options uh, to proceed with, I thought we could kind of create some uh, scenarios of, of a patient that might come in to, to see me. And, and then I, I would explain why I thought perhaps one treatment was better for that particular patient. So uh, for example, this is a case of a, a in this case, uh, there's, this is a 78 year old female who presents with five years of progressive sharp stabbing pain on the right side of her face. The pain is predominantly in B3, which means the lower third of the face. She had very classic triggers, eating, drinking, and cold wind. And she reported that she became increasingly tolerant to medications. And so she was feeling unsteady. She felt like she was living in a fog bank and uh, the pain uh, was, becoming more frequent and intense in nature despite going up on the medications. So uh, her past medical history plays a very, your, the past medical history plays an important role in how we uh, rec made recommendations. She's actually had a history of multiple uh, um, mini strokes and she has a history of uh, what they call atrial fibrillation an irregular heartbeat. And when you have an irregular heartbeat, the heart can throw clots and cause strokes. So she's right now, uh, she was on blood thinners at the time. So here we are, we have our choices, the rhizotomy, stereotactic radio surgery, and microvascular decompression. Okay. Um, in general, um, in patients who are in that scenario, um, probably undergoing longer uh, anesthesia is, is probably not the best thing for someone who has a cardiac history, has a history of strokes, and... Um, uh, is on a history of, of blood thinners. And, and the question that comes up then at this point is, well, can you come off your blood thinners or not? 
And uh, if you can, if the cardiologist says you can't come off the blood thinners, then you really have only one option, which is stereotactic radio surgery. But if you can come off blood thinners, uh, usually for about five to seven days before the surgery, and then you can start the blood thinners the day after, uh, uh, which is the rhizotomy, um, what you can do with the rhizotomy, then that might also be a good option. In general, for something like a microvascular decompression, we usually want the patients off the blood thinner about a week before. And then um, on the blood thinner, uh, possibly about a, um, I mean, they can resume their blood thinner usually about a week to two weeks after. So, you know, in this situation, we recommended a rhizotomy. And uh, a rhizotomy is a procedure where you basically uh, are trying to burn the nerve right as it comes out of the skull. Okay. And this is a picture from the Mayfield Institute. And what we do is we take a needle and we yeah, literally put the needle right here in the cheek, just a little bit um, to the side of the uh, lip. And using x-rays, we can feed it up the bottom of the skull, and then we can actually uh, inject the nerve. And if you look, it's going through something called foramen ovale. It's a hole in the skull. And you can put the needle right at the bottom of the skull. And if you look, this is V1, V2, and V3. V1 is the top third, V2 is the middle third, and V3 is the lower third of the face. As you can see, the needle probably gets pretty... Uh, gets really, uh, I mean, can do a good job of getting to V3 and to V2. V1 sometimes is a little harder to get to. And people with predominantly V1 pain, sometimes it's, it's not as good of a treatment just based on this anatomy here. But, you know, once we get the needle up there, what we do is we either inject something called glycerin, or we could do what's called radiofrequency, which is to burn the nerve, or some people have a little balloon there and they squash the nerve. In all three modalities, you're essentially uh, doing an ablation. You're hurting the nerve to stop it from firing. Now, the glycerol story is very interesting. This was actually uh, uh, discovered with, you know, serendipitously. And uh, Lars Luxell, who actually invented the gamma knife, um, was trying to treat patients with trigeminal neuralgia using radiation. And back then, uh, prior to the 1970s, which is when the CT scan was invented, they had to try to uh, use x-rays to figure out uh, anatomy. However, you couldn't figure out where that nerve lived. It was called Meckel's cave, unless you injected a contrast agent into that, that cavity. But the radiopaque material, which has to be metal-based, doesn't dissolve very well in water, as you know. If you put metal into water, it just sediments out. So what he did was he pulled glycerol uh, off the shelf and he mixed it with uh, this radiopaque uh, metal called tantalum. And then he injected it into patients. And um, a, a, a good number of those patients said my pain was better before he even started the, the radiation. So that's how glycerin or glycerol um, uh, came into uh, use. And of course we've been using it as in many decades. Uh, the whole thought about glycerol is that it's a super um, viscous solution. It means it, it's, it contains a lot of solutes in that, that fluid. And what it does is it almost desiccates or sucks the, the fluid out of the axons or the myelin that covers the axons and, and disrupts the, the pathway. Um, you know, early studies thought it was fantastic. This was one of the first studies, Hackinson, um, and they looked at 100 patients and he said 95% of the patients uh, experienced immediate relief. And 60% of those patients were, uh, had some mild numbness. Um, as a result, you know, it's been used for decades. Many people are have done it. Um, I would say probably hundreds of thousands of rhizotomies, probably even maybe millions have been done by now. And uh, overall, it's a good treatment. Um, the results are varied. It's not always 95%. I usually tell patients um, usually about 80 to 90% um, uh, chance of getting some pain relief. And, you know, there's an element of um, art to it or technique, you know, knowing how to place the needle um, and uh, knowing how much glycerol, how fast to inject it, um, the quality of the, the imaging once you get in there. Those are all little... Um, elements and tricks to try to uh, uh, maximize the efficiency. But, you know, what we've learned about rhizotomies is that it's not durable. In other words, it'll come back. And, and most of the people, as a rule of thumb, I, I usually tell people, uh, you know, within one to three years, expect the pain to come back. Um, I'm giving these numbers because I think some of these are, are favorable numbers. But 
most of the times uh, the effects can go anywhere from six months to, to seven years uh, in terms of relief. The, the nice thing is though, if you get good relief, you can go back and get that injection again and, and go home that same day. Um, people get, you know, can have it done every few years or every year in some cases, and they just go home with the bandaid that they peel off that night and they're uh, going back to their life. And so the downtime for this procedure, they're very minimal. Radio frequency rhizotomy is a variation on a theme. Uh, some people do radio frequency and glycerin. Um, and basically what you're doing is you have that, that needle tip can be heated up and can burn the nerve. And uh, the, again, the efficacy rates are very high, uh, greater than 90% in some series. Um, but the numbness rates can go up higher. Remember the numbness rates were about 60% with the glycerin. They, they reported as high as 90 to 100%. And um, again, it's not a durable, um, it's not a durable uh, therapy. It has to be done again. And so, you know, these are some of our series from, from Hopkins that we, when I was there at Hopkins, and you can see that we did, um, this has to be updated, um, we've done, you know, twice the number um, than this, um, but, you know, you can see that some of our patients have gotten, you know, 10, uh, even more than 10 uh, rhizotomies over the, their life and gotten some uh, meaningful relief and improvement in quality of life. Um, we looked and we said, can we repeat glycerol rhizotomies? And the, the outcomes are, all, are also quite good. And uh, radio frequency rhizotomies, uh, sometimes if you get them done multiple time over time, people can develop some, um, some side effects and people uh, report the side effects mainly as, as numbness in the face, but sometimes you can make the pain worse. You can create burning, searing pain, or some people uh, present with chewing weakness. And so with any of these uh, procedures, those are, are the risks, the cons to this. Those, the risks of that are very low, uh, probably somewhere between one to 2%, maybe 3% of any of those. And, and depending on your threshold for numbness, it, the numbness rates are higher, but you know, most of the time the numbness is confined to a certain region of the face. And it, when it is, almost all patients say that they would prefer that to the pain. However, in some cases, the entire face can be, uh, half of that face can be numb. And some people have really reported some, I really have, have said that they're not happy with that. In, in, um, in a lot of uh, situations, though, most clinicians start with a lower dose and, and move up um, because we are worried about those uh, complications. And uh, again, it's a small risk, but a real risk. So we talked about rhizotomies. Let's talk about a second case. So this is a 52 year old female who presented with eight years of progressive right-sided electrical pain. And she said that she couldn't brush her teeth. And uh, every time she brushed her teeth, she'd get horrible pain in her face. And, and uh, she went originally on some medications, Tegretol, which helped her, but uh, she's been now on multiple medications. And uh, again, having some side effects, she just can't, she doesn't feel as sharp at work. And so, you know, in terms of her past medical history, she's uh, very healthy. She's on no meds. She has uh, no heart history. And so in, in her situation, um, you know, this is a case where we may want to consider something like a microvascular decompression. And uh, as part of her workup, the MRI did show a compression of her trigeminal nerve uh, in, by the superior cerebellar artery, which is that artery. And so in, in her case, she's actually a, a candidate for all three of those therapies. Now, I've had plenty of patients who came into my clinic saying, you know, while I understand a microvascular decompression is, is a very uh, feasible option for me, or in fact, it's probably the preferable option, I got a lot going on in my life. And so I prefer to start with the rhizotomy or, or stereotactic radiosurgery, which uh, they can and, and, and schedule or do an MVD in the future. But in this case, uh, this person uh, elected to proceed with the microvascular decompression. And microvascular decompression is, a, um, is one of those procedures that um, I think is, is a really uh, you know, great story for medicine and, and surgery because um, it is one of the few procedures that we can really get, uh, potentially get a cure in patients. Now, the history of the microvascular decompression is interesting. This um, People have called it the Janetta uh, procedure, and uh, Peter Janetta at uh, University of Pittsburgh really um, drove the, uh, you know, really, I think, pushed the field forward and really got this procedure well known. 
Uh, interestingly enough, it was actually first developed by the uh, second chair at Johns Hopkins named Walter Dandy, who did the decompression, but it was Dr. Janetta who really took, took it and ran with it and really um, made, you know, optimized it and, and really got us good data to suggest that this therapy works. And uh, Dr. Janetta published this paper in the New England Journal. And uh, he, he, here, he, in this figure from that paper, they were showing that uh, there's a vessel compressing the nerve. And he published uh, their series of uh, almost 1,200 patients over a 20 year period. Now, um, I don't know if this will work, but um, so a micro, so this is a video that's an operative neurosurgery. Uh, it's duplicated because it's done in 3D stereo, but I um, apologize, you don't have the, the uh, uh, images. But basically um, what happens is uh, in this case, we, we're making a small opening behind the skull and um, a small incision behind the, the ear and we make a very small opening in the skull. Um, I like to use image guidance because there's a, a big vein around there. And so uh, it allows us to um, you know, know where that vein runs and then uh, allows us to make a very small opening in the skull. And, and then this is the, the course of the vein. And what we do is we uh, make a small opening. Uh, it's about the size of a quarter. And uh, after we take off that bone, we... Uh, open up what's called a covering to the brain called the dura. And after we open the, the dura, we um, just take a little piece of, uh, it's a cotton, a little piece of cotton, we just lay it on the brain. And then what we do is we just um, drain some fluid so the brain falls away. And this corridor is about, you know, four or five millimeters, half a centimeter or so. And after we open up that corridor, um, the brain falls away uh, very nicely. And um, I'm gonna skip forward a little bit in the interest of time. All we do is we just slip in front of the brain here. And so we just put the cotton right in front of the brain and um, we open up what's called the arachnoid layers. I'm going to just skip forward a little bit. And um, you can start seeing the nerve come into view here. And what we do is after we um, clear the uh, layers off of the nerve, we, um, as you clear, you can see that this vessel was touching the nerve here. And as we're releasing this uh, arachnoid layer, you can actually see that the vessel's falling away. And then what we do is we um, separate the, the artery from the nerve. And, um, you see that the artery actually pushed off the nerve, but this is the cushion that we put in. Everyone talks about the cushion. It's actually um, a piece of Teflon. Uh, it's actually a Teflon coated. Uh, it almost looks like a piece of felt, but all we do is we literally just put it there right between the artery and the nerve so that the artery doesn't fall back onto the nerve. Okay. And uh, after that, everything, um, uh, after that we, um, close everything up. See, the brain looks uh, nice and pristine. And all we do is we close the dural layer with sutures. And, um, you know, people uh, fill that defect in different ways, but we usually put a little bit of a, um, a dural substitute, they call it. And then we um, put a little bit of bone cement in there. Um, this is calcium hydroxyapatite, the same stuff your own bone is made of. And it literally just fills it in there. and um, uh, if you get a, a CAT scan in the future, it's almost, uh, it's very hard to tell wherever this opening was. And then um, uh, we close, we close you up. So here's a picture again, just uh, of the stills. So here we are, this vessel is again, compressing the nerve and um, you, uh, you can see here that once we've cleared away the arachnoid layers, we are able to actually just put a cushion between the artery and the nerve. And so if you can see, you can appreciate that the configuration is different in each individual. But uh, in this individual, we were able to get a very nice decompression and, and the patient did well. So from Dr. Janetta's paper, they showed that the most common um, 
a vessel that was uh, making contact was the superior cerebellar artery, but there's also veins that can touch uh, in that area. And uh, in terms of the complications, he showed that this is a very safe procedure. Um, I always tell the patients the biggest risk for this procedure is that it doesn't work. Um, I'll show you uh, the data, but you know, um, initially about 90% of the patients do well and about 70 to 80% of the patients actually are cured, uh, which is in terms of medical numbers, that's fantastic, but still it's not 100%. In terms of things such as uh, hearing loss and facial paralysis and double vision, um, those risks are very, very low. Um, you know, I would say, you know, at, at a high volume center, you're as well, uh, runs well under 1%. But this is the, this is the most impressive uh, data here. You can see that um, as the, um, as Dr. Janetta published the results, this is 20 years out, the overwhelming majority of patients are still pain free. And if the pain recurs, you can go and take them back and, and they still have uh, about, a, you know, about a 50%, more than 50% chance that you can get some pain relief. And overall at the end of the day is the 50-50 chance of having some uh, good pain relief after the surgery. So, you know, uh, patients always say, well, what's the, the predictor? You know, if you have immediate pain relief, that's usually a very good sign, but I tell patients it could take up to two to four weeks. And um, if you had symptoms uh, greater than eight years, it also um, was uh, suggested that you might have a little lower chance of success. But, you know, from Dr. Janetta's series, his conclusion was that, you know, this is a procedure that could potentially cure you. Um, as you can see, uh, it is more of a holistic approach. We're not trying to damage anything to make you feel better. We put the cushion in. And really, we, we almost want to make it so that no one knows we were ever there, which means that you could have um, a full life from this procedure. Um, I get asked a lot, what do you do if there's no compression? And so, um, you know, I've had cases like this and I've done, um, you know, a lot of these procedures. And, and so I think about this a lot. And so, you know, there's some, as we collaborate and, and I speak with other surgeons, um, you know, one of the things that we have been doing is some people actually inject glycerin right into the nerve right here in the bottom two thirds. Um, and that works really well, or they'll do something called neurolysis where we actually just split the nerve fibers. And um, that actually works very well in a lot of patients too. So, um, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, we, I, I, it's overall a safe procedure and uh, patients can do well. And in the right setting, uh, patients can um, actually even be cured of this. Now there's this question that I often get from my patients. Is it better to do an MVD first or can I wait and get a rhizotomy, right? This is one of the questions about timing. And so, uh, you know, I've had some really bright students I worked with over the years and, um, you know, uh, what we did was we took some of the more, um, advanced cases, the patients who've had really long uh, lasting tracheal neuralgia, as, as I indicated earlier, the patients who have long lasting tracheal neuralgia don't do as well. But what they opted to do was they tried to have an MVD um, second. And so if the patients had an MVD second, they did do a little bit worse in terms of, of survival compared, I mean, in terms of uh, durable pain relief compared to patients who uh, got it in their primary setting. Let's go with the third case. This is an 83 year old gentleman who presented with 15 years of progressive left sided facial pain that was sharp and stabbing. And the patient again has tried multiple medications. And when we went to the past medical history in this gentleman, this patient had a, a problem with the heart in terms of its rhythm. And uh, the patient has been on blood thinners and has had, um, every time he's come off the blood thinners, he's developed some clots in his leg. And he also had a pulmonary embolus where the clot went into his lungs. And so in talking with his primary care doc and his cardiologist, they said, I don't feel comfortable with him coming off uh, anticoagulation even for a week. And so uh, with this gentleman, the only option really is stereotactic radio surgery. And uh, again, these are good procedures. So, you know, in terms of radio surgery for trigeminal neuralgia, there are uh, the two major devices that are out there is the gamma knife and the cyber knife. Um, there's a machine now by Novalis, but they work all on uh, two concepts, on um, one single concept, which is if you take a, 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 a small beam of radiation with very low energy and you um, have the beams crisscross on one 
point, which is the nerve, then the sum of all those tiny little nerves at that crisscrossed point will be very high. But the, the amount of energy that each beam has on its own should not damage anything. I don't know if that makes sense, but basically you're just converging upon one point. And so this procedure, the trigeminal algebra is extremely precise. It's um, with these machines, it's uh, accurate to half a millimeter, uh, which is you know less than the thickness of your fingernail. And so what we do is again, remember I told you about the trigeminal nerve, you can actually uh, see the trigeminal nerve and you can actually um, put a little spot of radiation on there to, to um, basically damage the nerve to stop it from firing. Again, this concept is not new. Uh, this idea was uh, first presented in 1951 by Lexell. Remember when I was telling you the glycerin story? And at, even then they had 50% success. And then in the mid 1990s in Pittsburgh, they started treating patients with the gamma knife and, and trigeminal neuralgia. And Dr. Kanziolka in 1996 published really the first seminal paper showing that they um, could deliver radiation um, very precisely. And in uh, 220 patients, they were able to get a uh, good pain relief in two thirds of the patient. And, um, but you know, over time, a lot of the patients did have recurrence of pain. And since that study in 1996, um, you know, in the um, 15 plus years, we've learned that the amount of radiation that you give how, how much of the nerve is treated with radiation and where exactly you put that spot of radiation on the nerve all affects how patients do and the rate of complications for those patients. And so for example, they did a study where they gave 90 grays of radiation versus 70 grays of radiation. These are very, very high doses of radiation. And uh, they based this off studies, uh, animal studies, where they saw that the axons um, started to um, die after 90 grays. So they went to the maximum limit, but they had, they stopped at the end of the study. They found that more patients had complications. Um, complications were very similar to the rhizotomy. Patients could have burning searing pain. They could have really bad numbness. They had some patients had problems with chewing. And so, um, you know, most of the times the, the radiation doses dropped to 70 gray. This was uh, another study that came out of Pittsburgh where they you know, painted or treated a longer length of nerve with radiation and found again that there was a higher uh, risk of having complications. And so they backed off on the size uh, or amount of nerve that's treated. And it turns out, again, I'm not gonna go through this data, but where on the, along the nerve you treat makes a difference. So the bottom line is that, you know, people have figured out kind of the sweet spot and sweet dose to um, treat patients with radiation and, and get some good relief. And, you know, over time, people, um, we've learned and people have had, um, you know, complications from this, very similar to um, some of the rhizotomy, uh, when they call it decreased corneal reflex, if you have decreased sensation in the top part of your face, you could have some numbness in the eye and people have had um, problems with eye infections, they've had problems with chewing, they've had some problems with numbness, and, um, you know, uh, sometimes people have even had some weakness because the brainstem is right next door. But again, this is a very safe procedure. These risks are, are very, very low. The numbness risk again is higher, uh, just like in the, the rhizotomy. But as I mentioned before, the dose, the length and the location of the nerve really matters. And again, you wanna do it in a place that uh, does a lot of these. Now, um, you know, this was, a, this was a publication and I apologize, I, I don't have the, uh, reference here, but I, I'll get that for you. But, you know, there was a, a very nice paper that looked at the costs of, of, of these treatments and, um, you know, microvascular decompression uh, and radiation are actually very comparable in, in terms of cost. And the rhizotomy, while it is cheaper, um, you know, in terms of cost for treatment and in terms of medical care, you know, you get the rhizotomies multiple times uh, versus a one-shot deal. And you can see how the costs can go up. But in general, this is kind of the paradigm that we use in recommending treatments for patients. A younger or healthy patient um, usually um, is directed towards a microvascular decompression because as you can see, it's a more durable treatment effect. In a person that uh, has high comorbidities or high risk for surgery, um, sometimes a rhizotomy or radiation is a better option. But you know, I've had patients who are, you know, for example, I had a patient in, in you know, uh, their late eighties, who was you know, probably, you know, physiologically looking like that person was in their sixties. And 
Um, in those situations, I've done microvascular decompressions. I've done uh, rhizotomies in patients in their 50s when they've just had just terrible um, uh, health issues with them. And so, you know, this is just a, um, uh, a general guideline, but certainly uh, not something that we um, uh, stick hard and fast to. So, you know, to summarize, you know, patients can get, you know, radiofrequency rhizotomies, the glycerol rhizotomy, radiation, or microvascular decompression. And the bottom line is that they're all very effective. They can actually take, do a good job of getting you pain relief. In terms of recurrence rate, though, with rhizotomies, you have pretty high chance of it coming back and probably within a few years. With radiation, I usually say um, there's probably, a, again, a good chance uh, that you're going to get the pain back. And the microvascular decompression offers the highest chance of durability. Um, again, in terms of long-term recurrence rates, um, MVDs are very durable. Uh, rhizotomies, you're probably going to have a high chance of it coming back. And then in terms of uh, side effects, things such as numbness, uh, the numbness rates are higher in patients who get uh, the rhizotomies or radiation, um, you know, 60% or more. But with the microvascular decompression, um, while it's even published at 2%, it's probably even lower than that. So um, I wanted to present a couple other cases. Uh, this is a 62-year-old female who presented with constant burning on her uh, right side of her face um, with no triggers and uh, no past medical history. And, you know, this is, uh, in general, what we've learned from our literature, at best, 60% is what I found when I looked through the different literature, but it's actually much lower than that. Uh, in general, when patients have atypical facial pain, they just don't do as well with any of these procedures. And in fact, the rhizotomy or radiation, I think, could actually make it worse for people. And then patients uh, with MS. You know, when patients come in uh, with MS uh, to, to my clinic, um, you know, we've we've done some studies back. Um, you know, this was a study that we did at Hopkins, um, and when we looked at the patients with uh, MS and we treated some of the highest numbers of patients with MS, it turns out that the rhizotomies work really well. And uh, in general, again, um, you could have uh, complications, of course, like the burning pain. But, you know, instead of 90% uh, or 80%, I generally say, you know, with these numbers, we say 60, but it's usually 60 to 70% of the patients we can get pretty good pain control with MS. Now, some of my MS patients come with a pretty big artery compressing the nerve, and we've had some good success uh, treating MS patients with microvascular decompressions. Um, radiation has also been... Uh, uh, very, uh, has also been shown to be effective in patients with MS. Initially, there was a fear of giving radiations to patients with MS, but um, for fear of triggering an, a new MS flare, but patients actually have done well and tolerated it. What about pain in the setting of tumors? So um, uh, it, as part of my other practice, I actually take out brain tumors and um, this part of the brain where the trigeminal nerve is, is where um, I, I do a lot of, or I, I take care of a lot of patients with tumors in this area. And for example, this patient had a tumor that was compressing the fifth nerve here um, and here. And this patient presented with sharp stabbing pain. And uh, uh, here is the common types of meningioma, schwannoma, um, and what they call trigeminal schwannomas um, or vestibular schwannomas. And what we did was, um, you know, as we followed the patients out, um, it turns out that if you uh, remove the tumor, uh, most of the times we can get the patient's um, pain under control or patients feel a lot better. And sometimes the tumor is very big and it's hard to take all of it out. But if we go in there very intentionally and debulk the tumor around the nerve, patients have done really well. Um, I apologize, but one of the other uh, slides that I wanted to put in here also was that um, I've also done in, in some of my older patients a rhizotomy in those settings and a glycerin rhizotomies, particularly with patients who have, for example, meningiomas in that area. And that works really well too. So um, we're uh, in the midst of writing that series up. Um, the last thing I wanted to comment on, and I'm I apologize, the slide that wasn't here is what about the patients who come in with what I call mixed symptoms, the patients who have both sharp stabbing and some of the atypical facial pain. And, um, you know, what I always tell, what I always ask my patients is if I can get rid of the sharp stabbing electrical pain, can I make your life better? And if they say yes, then, um, you know, I have offered and done things such as the MBDs and rhizotomies. I tend to steer more towards MBDs because the rhizotomy risks making the other atypical components worse. 
And in general, we've had very good success. I would say about 70% of my patients, maybe even a little bit more than that, have actually gotten very good relief from their sharp stabbing pain and, and done well. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, with any of these numbers, if you notice, I didn't say 100. Um, uh, I, I do say this to my patients a lot. I am humbled by God every day in my life. And sometimes there's other causes of facial pain. And despite all these things, even the patients who present with classic pain, you know, I, and I've seen patients from other surgeons who've done all the right things too, and they just have this sharp stabbing pain that's uh, going away. So, you know, with that, we're now trying to do better. And, um, you know, for example, we have a trigeminal neurology program. We're trying to do research, both clinic with clinical research, as you can see, I showed you some of our clinical research asking questions about sequence, but also we're trying to do research work. And, you know, uh, you know, so my patients have been very generous, for example, at Hopkins and at Stanford, and they'll um, elect to give, for example, CSF and blood um, when they're, you know, in surgery. And we've created a biobank and, and we've created the central repository at Hopkins, for example, so that, you know, people from other institutions are now, you know, uh, collaborating with us um, to test samples. So we have a lot of people trying hard to try to figure out the cause of pain for our patients. Um, and we've done things such as cytokine analysis as part of my research. I'm very interested in neuroinflammation. I, I started with vaccines for brain tumors, but also very interested in neuroinflammation causing facial pain. And, um, you know, uh, we're trying to do clinical trials. Uh, CGRP, for example, is another pain pathway. It's called calcitonin gene-related peptides. And, um, you know, these are, um, again, uh, found to be elevated in patients with uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, we worked with a, a company where um, they're uh, funding a trial and it's across 10 sites in the U.S. now. Um, and so um, hopefully there's a site, you know, that's uh, accessible for everyone in the U.S. And what we're doing is it's a drug called uh, Remigipant. Um, it's actually now been FDA approved for uh, migraines, but it's a pill that you can take to, to block this. And we're hoping that maybe and some of our patients who just have this refractory pain, we can do better. And the objective is to assess safety and efficacy. And uh, again, you know, there's amongst many things for eligibility. Um, uh, for example, people who've had uh, their gallbladders removed can't be part of this case, uh, this um, trial, because the drug is uh, removed by the, the liver. But, you know, we're trying to get patients with both typical and atypical pain onto the trial. Now, as, as, as many of you know, people who have been on clinical trials can go be randomized, right? So people say, oh my gosh, what if I'm randomized to the placebo and I don't get better? So, um, you know, this trial was designed so that, you know, initially you get the drug or you don't, and, and, but you'll be on it for two weeks and then we allow for a washout and then you get, you, it gets flipped. And um, so you're, in, you're gonna be uh, assured to get the drug. You just don't know if it's first or second if you enter into this trial. So with that, you know, I'd like to thank you for your time. Hopefully, um, you know, it gave you some insight into how uh, um, we think in terms of recommending treatments or surgical treatments for our patients with trigeminal neuralgia. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I work with a fantastic group of neurosurgeons here at Stanford and uh, radiation oncologists and, um, you know, our clinical trials division. Also uh, got uh, the privilege to be able to work with some very bright students and residents over the years, um, a collaborator, Tina Doshi, and, and Dr. Wong, and Dr. Bedegata, Dr. Jackson, and Dr. Belsberg. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Carson actually started the trigeminal neurology program before I got there uh, many years ago, and uh, ben, uh, ben Carson and Carol James, um, you know, uh, started that program before I, uh, I took it over. So, again, wanted to acknowledge that it's a you know, great group effort. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Lin. That was so great. We have a bunch of questions that have come in. I had a bunch of questions I wrote down, but I will put mine last because I know I can follow up with you. And by the way, if anybody is interested in getting more information about the, uh, the drug study that uh, Dr. Lim was talking about, it is on our website. And um, we can provide you with more information. So you can just email info at tna-support.org, call the office, uh, and we can uh, connect you with that information. Okay, I'm going to go back to, let's see. 
you actually answered a question about trigeminal schwannoma. Um, this woman had the craniotomy for, for one of those in 2017. She still has facial pain. What would you recommend for her to maybe think about trying next? Sure. So, you know, uh, with trigeminal schwannomas, after the resection is done, sometimes if patients still have sharp stabbing or electrical pain, they could be eligible for things such as the rhizotomy or uh, maybe radiosurgery. Um, but sometimes I see patients who, after a trigeminal schwannoma, uh, come back with burning or constant pain or aching pain. And uh, in that situation, you know, it's, you, you know, you, I generally say you probably don't want to try to do a rhizotomy or radiofrequency rhizotomies or, or radiation because it actually can exacerbate the pain. And so um, I usually say it's good to start with a pain doctor and try to see if there's some other medical therapies that could potentially help and alleviate that. But trigeminal schwannomas can be tough because they can also cause real bad pain. Okay. Um, does something, this is a little slightly off the topic of surgery, but it's, it's a great question. Does, um, for people who have bilateral on both sides, trigeminal neuralgia, is there something that predisposes people? Is there some commonality that you have seen in patients that have bilateral trigeminal neuralgia? You know, that's a great question. And um, it's been rare. I don't have, I mean, I, you know, I probably, uh, I probably have seen probably 5,000 patients with um, facial pain over probably more than that. Um, but, you know, well, of the 5,000, I would say um, only probably 100 maybe cases out of 5,000. So it's rare, but, you know, I think that's why it's so important. And I think that's why it's so great that patients are willing to you know, help. And as they go through surgery, we're, we're trying to sequence and try to see if there's an association. Okay. Um, I think you answered that question. Let's see. Um, uh, do you have any thoughts on acupuncture on the face? Or for that matter, because I've seen this on our Facebook group, um, people actually talk about like 10 units or something on their face. Yeah, I don't, I, I, patients haven't really talked to me as much about acupuncture on their face, but um, in general, I, I, there have been a subset of patients that have really gotten great relief with um, acupuncture, both for the atypical and the typical pain. So I'm a fan of uh, acupuncture and if people uh, want to try it, I, I encourage people to try it. Um, just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean that maybe some of my patients have gotten it. I just, I didn't, I, I guess I um, assumed that there was one spot, but I, 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 I don't know if people have all gotten on their face or not, but I think it's, um, if you go to a place that's reputable and well-experienced, then, you know, acupuncture is a great thing to do. In terms of TENS units and other things such as facial, facial stimulators, it does work in some people. It just people have to try and um, it doesn't work for everybody. And as I get, as you know, brings me back to that thing where my initial statement where it's a clinical diagnosis, there's probably a heterogeneous group of, of, of entities that are causing face pain in people. Um, and I believe, well, I know that we at the FPA uh, uh, have information on um, acupuncture. So if you're interested, you can contact us, you can go to our website. And I believe we have a presentation by Dr. Stanton um, did that, uh, covered that topic at our first virtual conference. So there's a video on it as well. Um, do MVDs result in hearing loss often? So um, MVDs, I mean, generally it's a very safe procedure. The rate of hearing loss is very, very low. Um, it, it can happen. And uh, I always tell people just like riding in an airplane or, or you know, a plane crashes every so often, there's, there's uh, probably something to someone's anatomy that's unpredicted. It's very, very rare, but it can happen. Okay. Um, that's the risk I certainly counsel my patients about too. Can you talk about briefly uh, the, I don't know what this is, transposition MVD technique? Yeah, so um, 
I think what they're getting at is, so people have done things such as slings and um, what they'll do is they'll move the artery away and some people glue them. You know, the whole point is to try to get the artery away from the nerve and uh, um, try to reduce the pressure. Um, in terms of, of those procedures, I, you know, I think that they're all good, good, and good. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I just had a patient who was asking me about that. And I said, it's your choice, whichever one you want, I'll do. <laughs> but um, I generally like to put the padding in. Um, if I have a really, really big artery um, and it's really squashing it, even with that, I tend to um, uh, consider something like a sling. Um, but, uh, um, and in some people, sometimes the artery just falls away and you could put a little bit of glue to ensure that it doesn't go. I mean, I think there's a, uh, uh, situation for all of them and, you know, um, your surgeon may have a preference for one and they're all great. Okay. Thank you. Um, have you heard of, correct me, I'm not going to pronounce this right. I already know. The neurolysis, what's it called when they kind of comb the nerve? Yeah. Is that? Yeah, neurolysis. Neurolysis. Have you heard of doing a neurolysis and then kind of immediately following up with the rhizotomy, kind of doing both? Um, so, I mean, I, I, don't, I usually don't do it in one sitting, but, you know, sometimes with neurolysis, um, you can have limitations in how you do the neurolysis and um, uh, you can't split the nerve fibers as well as you want because the nerve could be super short. And in those situations, we can certainly uh, consider doing a, a rhizotomy. Now, some of my patients have said to me, I'm really, really worried about, you know, the numbness and the burning pain and, and making it worse. And so uh, I have sometimes said, well, we'll just stop at the neurolysis and, you know, I'm a little worried about giving you the, the rhizotomy. Um, I've also had patients where, you know, we've done like a microvascular decompression and neurolysis and we just haven't made them any better. And um, uh, I always take a little bit of pause because you got two procedures and it doesn't make you any better. Um, sometimes when you keep going at it, you can actually leave the patient a lot worse. So I always just, sometimes I say, let's take a break and talk with our pain specialist and think about other things. It's not that I won't do it, it's just that you know, I have seen and uh, patients get the anesthesia dolorosa, which is the burning searing pain. And it's, it's a, it, you know, patients have sometimes said to me, I wish you never did that. I would have lived with the other pains. So I, I sympathize. My heart is, you know, goes out to all my patients for that, but we just want to be as thoughtful as possible with those. Thank you. Um, let's just talk for a minute because we could do a whole other webinar on this. And actually, I know we're going to do a presentation on this at the conference um, repeat MVDs. So do you do repeat MVDs on, uh, someone with typical or TN1, uh, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, with a compression that failed to provide pain relief, or would you maybe then say, let's try something else next? So the answer is both. I think it depends on the patient. So you know, some of my patients said the MBD works so well, I really want to do it again. And if they, they feel strongly that they want to, we can, yeah, I, I've done plenty of redo MBDs. Um, sometimes though, we always get imaging. And if the vessel looks like it's far away and not really touching, I tell people sometimes with an MBD, you are manipulating the nerve, you're technically disrupting the nerve fibers a little bit. And that might've been what got you the relief. And maybe it'll be a little bit easier on you if we go down the path of a rhizotomy. And so if I think that there's nothing touching, then, then we'll do that. I do, I have to say though, I learn every day. And so I, I recently had a patient who had a vessel that was far away, but um, they really, really wanted me to explore. So we went back in and I um, actually moved the pledge a little bit and, and put in another pledge somewhere else. And that patient woke up and has been pain-free for, for many years now. So um, I don't use, I used to use the vessel being off the nerve as my Bible, um, but now uh, you know, we learn every day. And so sometimes, um, you know, if the patient really wants that, we'll, we'll consider that too. Okay. Um, what do you think about a nerve block for trigeminal neuralgia? 
Yeah, so I, I mean, a nerve block is a very, very broad term um, in terms of uh, people can get a nerve block right here. They could get a nerve block in what they call the sphenopalatine ganglion, which is right at the, the very back where the nerve branches off. And so, um, you know, in, t in general, the nerve blocks can be sometimes helpful in, in decision making. So a sphenopalatine block, if it works, sometimes I'll offer a rhizotomy or an MBD after in a case that's not clear. Um, someone who gets a block up here, if it works for them, I usually say keep going with it if it works for you because it's very minimally invasive. Um, we're getting several questions about the Biohaven trial. So let's give them, it. Uh, it is Biohaven that is trialing this drug. Can you repeat the name of the drug, please? Yeah, um, I, they call it, it's called NURTEC now, N-U-R-T-E-C. Um, I don't know if I have it in my disclosure. I, I am a consultant for them because they did uh, um, uh, fund the trial and, um, you know, I do work with them for cancer related therapy. So I, I want okay. to make this disclosure, um, but, um, uh, but that's, you know, when I, when they had that for pain patients, that's, you know, the, the CEO was really wants to help patients. And, you know, I really give them credit for coming into this, um, for patients with trigeminal neuralgia to help. Yeah, and they engage the Facial Pain Association early, um, mm -hmm. get input from patients to to um, to to create the structure of the trial as well. Um, and for everybody out there, it is on our website. What we do is we have sent emails out, targeted emails to people who live within a certain radius of each of the ten sites that are. Um, trialing this drug. So if you have not given us your uh, information, your email, you may not be receiving information. If you live within a certain radius of these trials um, and we have your information, you would have received and probably will still receive additional information, really, but for other trials as well. It's possible that we will send other uh, targeted emails and we do send general emails about different trials. So if you want more notification about um, trials and research in general, um, all kinds of information, we just started a research initiative. So there's lots of information on our website. Okay. Oh, this is a good question. Do you have a few, can we keep going on for a little bit? Cause sure. great questions here. I know we're going over time, but I'm okay if you're okay. <laughs> sure. You're on the spot there. Okay. This is a great question though. For patients with cervical spine injury issues on MV, uh, for an MVD, are there alternative positioning options to use for surgery? Well, so when we position patients, um, I can either have you sitting with your neck turned like this, or sometimes we actually lay you on what we call a park bench position. It literally looks like you're laying on a park bench. And when we do that, that really doesn't really stretch the neck much and uh, puts, um, so for patients who have uh, cervical spine disease, um, we certainly do have options to do that. Okay, great. Um, Let's see. Uh, okay. For someone who has uh, an MRI showing a visible compression, but clinical symptoms are predominantly atypical. So I guess this is more of the combination pain. And you did kind of, you did kind of speak to some of that. Um, but just real quickly, um, uh, would an MVD be likely to relieve some of their pain? Yeah, so I guess I'd always, I always distill it back to the question of if you have some sharp stabbing or electrical pain, um, and if that's, if getting rid of that pain will make your life better, or you think it will, then an MBD uh, could be a very reasonable option. But if you say, no, it's really the burning or constant or pulling pain, and I really wanna get rid of that, I, I think that you'll be, the patient will be disappointed with an MBD in terms of results. Doesn't mean it won't work, but more likely than not, it won't. I think it's really important for patients to hear from their doctors that they're consulting with, you know, the, the, the truth and the facts. And, you know, it's better to go in with um, reasonable expectations if they decide to have a treatment. I think it's really important. You mentioned with a few of those case studies, as far as 
not just their age and their health, but you you mentioned, you know, some of this comes down to what they do for a career, what's going on with their family, what kind of support they have. Are they caring for small children? There's, there's lots of uh, decisions, I think, that go into um, making, you know, deciding on treatment options. Yeah, exactly. You want to tailor it. And I always tell patients you're choosing between good, good and good but one is probably better for you. <laughs> and let's figure out which one it is. And speaking of that, can you just really quickly give a, you know, give a synopsis of what recovery process or um, and timeline of recuperation for an MVD patient? And I know, and this is a big one, we know that this varies. Everybody is individual. Everyone is different. Yeah. So it does vary. I mean, I think I showed in my video, I, I really moved to this minimally invasive. We make very small openings in the skull. And, um, you know, it's different for everybody, but in terms of, uh, you know, my patients in general, the surgery takes about an hour, hour and a half. Um, and, uh, um, you know, most of my patients go, uh, what we call to an intermediate care unit, uh, overnight and they get to go home the next day. Um, the incision, uh, you know, patients don't like getting pokes. So I put in resorbable sutures. So, you know, after they're done, they're done. And uh, because you can, uh, because it's what we call, and, you know, many of us across the country are moving towards this, you know, patients are up and walking the next day. Some are running errands by the end of the week. Um, some people um, feel a little soreness in their neck and don't want to drive for a week or two, but, you know, because we're not disrupting the brain, they should have their, their full uh, function. What's interesting enough is sometimes people feel a little bit of more fatigue from, I think, the anesthesia and they can have some lingering effects and they feel just tired or um, low energy for a, few, uh, a couple of weeks after, but that's totally normal too. And uh, others don't have that reaction and they're you know, back and doing their stuff. Okay, a quick question about radiation. You talked about stereotactic radiation, ra radio surgery. Um, is radiotherapy where it's given over multiple uh, sessions done on trigeminal neuralgia or is it really strictly the one dose, one time radiation? Right, so that's a great question. It turns out that the amount of energy that you hit that nerve with uh, makes the difference. And so I, I once saw a patient who had a trigeminal schwannoma and they gave a lower dose of radiation over and that actually made her miserable. Her pain flared up to this point where she was just miserable for three months. You really have to go with that one shot and hit it with that 70 gray radiation. If you go down with 30 gray, it almost tickles the nerve so that it makes it worse than some people I've seen. Not in everybody, but it risks worsening it. So it really is a one shot deal. And, and one of the reasons, that was my question actually. And the reason why I asked is because in my experience working with the patient community, um, sometimes doctors who have available technology to them will offer whatever technology they have. Um, I might be wrong about that, but my concern is that people don't know the difference between the different options and um, whoever they see who does that type of, um, of radio surgery or radiotherapy, they might not be knowing the, the full picture. Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes people have a, um, and I think it's it's uh, always with uh, the right intentions and the right motives. Some some people believe that one's way better than the other, and and that there's a um, you know predilection for one person. Um, I think it's always good to see someone who does all of them, and then they can give you a, a you know just a, an opinion on pros and cons of all of them, but. It doesn't mean that the person who does all of them is better than the one who does one. <laughs> I want to make that clear. But um, I think, you know, with trigeminal neuralgia, it's very reasonable to get multiple opinions. Um, yes. And then figure out what, what because, you know, this is, again, a disease that, um, you know, doesn't, won't take your life. But, you know, when you decide an intervention, you should want to choose the right one and feel comfortable with it. Because once you choose one, you know, you've, you've done something and, uh it can have implications on success rates of subsequent procedures. I think that's a great place to leave it. I would say that the Facial Pain Association encourages everybody 
to feel comfortable um, telling their doctors uh, that they're going to get second opinion, get a third opinion. I think that at some point you're going to make your decision based on um, what's best for you, but you need to feel confident with your doctor. So you need to um, feel comfortable getting that second opinion. Thank you, Dr. Lim. I still have so many questions here. Most of them are left over our mind. I got to most people's questions here, but I think we're going to maybe have to do an article or something, a little Q&A, because this was really so informative. Um, it was so much information really packed into one presentation. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. And uh, it's an honor to be here. And I hope everyone has a good evening now. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, you can email me, you can email the office uh, with further questions. And I'm happy to, um, is that okay with you? Dr. Lim already offered yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, you pass it my email, to you. if you look up my name and Stanford University on the university website, on the top right is my email. I, I'm available to all my patients all the time. So Fantastic. And it's also on our website as well. So thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Have a happy Thanksgiving.